Well, welcome to our NCAA.com March Madness Skype session. I'm Andy Katz, and I'm pleased to be joined by Bruce Rasmussen, the chair of the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee for 2018, and of course, also the Creighton Athletic Director. And here on Sunday, Bruce, you guys re released your top 16 as it stands right now here in middle of February, about a month away from Selection Sunday. And what I want to do is sort of go through each region, and we can talk about each one. And then maybe I'll throw one school out at you that maybe didn't get into the 16 and see what you think. So okay. let's start out. I'm just going to do sort of what you guys did from the south. And in the south, you guys had Virginia as a one, Cincinnati's a two, Michigan State as a three, Tennessee as a four. So Virginia loses on Sunday to Virginia Tech at home in overtime. But they've got great road and neutral site wins. What was the theory behind putting Virginia as a number one overall and the number one in the South? Well, first of all, uh, Virginia, when you look at their the roughly 25 games they played, you know, sometimes people focus on what happened in the last week. It's one out of 25. And Virginia has, uh, is 13 and two in the first two quadrants. Uh, they have, they're 10 and one away from home. Uh, they have uh, a strength of schedule of eight. Uh, they are, uh, uh, I think that their quality of wins was a little better than others. They're obviously an awesome defensive team, much better balanced offensively, but we just thought their entire resume uh, was better than anyone else's. How much did the win at Duke really jump out at the committee? Well, the win at Duke was certainly a good win, and uh, but again, it was it's one out of twenty five. It was it was total body of work with Virginia. All right, so you have Cincinnati's a two, Michigan City's a three, Tennessee's a four. So Cincinnati, you know, I think sort of has been that team that's not gotten the the national recognition that it deserves. And I know they're playing today as we're taping this um, against SMU, but they had one bad week. That's it, the whole season, one bad week where they lost to Xavier. And then they lost to Florida on a neutral court. How did you guys assess where the Bearcats are, are right now? Well, they're an outstanding team. There's no question they're an outstanding team. They haven't had the quantity of opportunities that a Virginia has had or even anyone on the first seed line. But they still have an opportunity with 25% of their schedule left. They still have an opportunity uh, to work their way up. Michigan State is interesting because... There was a stretch in December where they played a lot of lower-level teams, uh, even though that they just knocked off Purdue at home, um, and they did crush North Carolina out in Portland. But they had that neutral court loss to Duke. They lost pretty badly to Ohio State on the road. Um, what was the thinking with Michigan State right now, based on how they're playing versus really their body of work? Well, first of all, Michigan State did have a lot of games that we would call fourth quadrant games, uh, but they also had some quality games. If you look at their non-conference schedule, uh, they played in the PK-80, they played in the Champions Classic in Chicago. Uh, they have uh, some definitely high-quality wins. When you say that they have beat North Carolina, they have beat Purdue, they beat Notre Dame when Notre Dame was at full strength, so they have some real quality wins. They just haven't had the number of opportunities that a lot of people above them have had. And it'll be interesting because they don't the rest of the conference season, but they will obviously, or they potentially could in the, in the Big Ten tournament. So Tennessee's interesting here because Tennessee, actually, I've looked at them a lot. They've got you know a really good resume. If you just block off a bad loss in terms of the margin of defeat, not in terms of who they are playing when they lost to Alabama on Saturday, uh, how much did that cause any pause, the margin of, of their defeat against Alabama versus their overall body of work. The committee doesn't look at margin of defeat at all. You know, it was at Alabama. Sometimes you can take a game that's a one or two possession game with four or eight minutes left and that it, that blows up a little bit. But, uh, you know, the fact that they, Alabama's a tough place to play. Alabama's been very up and down. Uh, Tennessee just didn't have quite the quantity of wins. They were nine and six in quadrant one and two, which wasn't as co comparable as a lot of the people above them. All right, let's go to the east where you've got Villanova one, Duke two, Texas Tech three, and Ohio State four. Um, Villanova lost at home to St. John's. They lost at Butler, but overall, uh, in large part because of their you know, what they're dealing with their pavilion uh, facility on campus. They played a lot of games actually away from home. And that's something Jay Wright told me that he actually almost didn't realize how many games they played away from home. Yeah. 
So how much did that factor into when you were looking at and analyzing at Villanova? Well, first of all, it's a great point. First of all, Villanova is, is 13 and one away from home. And when the committee looks at uh, the body of work of a team and you see that a team and winning away from home, whether it's neutral or road, is the most difficult thing to do in sport. Uh, to be 13 and one away from home was a very powerful statement. There was a lot of discussion about Villanova and Virginia, obviously, but uh, didn't feel like uh, Villanova's quality of wins was quite the same as Virginia's. So Duke's interesting because Duke, early in the season, especially PK-80, had great wins or, or very good wins at the time when those teams were playing well, like Florida and Texas. Um, but what's interesting is their losses at Boston College, which is an okay team, but you know a little bit lower, obviously, in the ACC. Losing at St. John's, which hadn't won a game in the conference that you're very familiar with in the Big East. Um, you know, the, the NC State game, uh, certainly in North Carolina, those are two teams that potentially, you know, we got Carolina here we'll discuss. But, you know, I wouldn't call those bad losses. So how did you look at where Duke is on this two line versus a couple of those losses I just highlighted? Well, Duke has four uh, Q1 or Quadrant one wins, which are quality wins, uh, and all of them were away from home. So to have the quality of wins that they have had away from home was a pretty strong statement about Duke, even though they didn't have the number of wins that some of the people above them had. And those wins came early in the season, but this is to our point that I know we've talked about a lot, is that every game counts. So even though those best wins came before the first of the year, those still matter here in mid-February. And those still count just as much as a win in mid-February. And sometimes we overreact to the past week or the past two weeks and uh, one way or the other. And, uh, and so you look at the entire body of work with Duke, and, and they had some real quality wins. There was a lot of discussion about that, that line. And how about Texas Tech at three? Uh, a school right now that's uh, alone in the, uh, atop the Big 12, they have that road win at Kansas, um, a very good win over Nevada earlier in the season. Uh, you could argue when they beat Northwestern in November, you know, that was when Northwestern had its full full team and, you know, was supposed to be better than maybe they are now. And they actually destroyed Northwestern at the time. Yeah, when you look at Texas Tech, if you watch them play, they, they are deep, they're athletic, they guard, they play hard, they play in a good league. Uh, in all of the metrics, they rank high in all six metrics. Uh, they have four road wins in in quadrant one, so they're a quality team. Uh, they were, uh, uh, I can't, I thought they were six and four, uh, away from home and they were eight and three in quadrant one and two, which is a little bit less than the people ahead of them. So Ohio state's interesting because I was at their game against Purdue, which is a phenomenal win. And that may end up being one of the best wins of any team this, this season, because Mackey arena is one of the toughest places to play. I don't care what year it is. They blew out Michigan State. So those are their two best wins by far. And those are two great wins. Yes. But that might be the best they have. And I'm curious, is, is that why they're at a four uh, when some Ohio State fans would say, wait a minute, we look, look where we are and why wouldn't we be higher? Well, first of all, Ohio State, I think, is 12-1 and one in their last 13 games. So they have been playing very well as of late. Uh, I saw them play in the PK-80 early, uh, and as you said, they're adjusting to a new coach uh, and to a new system. Uh, they certainly are playing well lately, but again, we look at the entire body of work. We look at all the games they have played, and they have certainly moved up based on what's happened in the last few weeks, and they'll have an opportunity, much like Michigan State, they'll have an opportunity, you would think, in the uh, potentially in the Big Ten tournament. Uh, but, uh, they're a nice team. We just didn't feel that when we looked at the entire uh, bracket or uh, body of work that they were uh, quite as good as some of the teams above them. But they're playing very well lately. Yeah, I think Ohio State and Duke, to that degree, uh, are great examples that conference affiliation only matters in terms of who you play, not where you stand at the end of the season. Because you know Ohio State could win the Big Ten outright and be a lower seed than Purdue and Michigan State. Duke could finish, who knows, third or fourth in the ACC right. and yet be a higher seed at two. All right, so let's go to the Midwest. Xavier had a phenomenal week. They won at Butler and then in a crazy game at your school, yeah. <laughs> knocked off Creighton. So they're the one. 
We got Auburn at two, Clemson at three, Oklahoma at four. So let's go down the line. First, Xavier, what were you most impressed by? Well, first of all, Xavier has 14 wins in the first two quadrants. I think that's more than any other team. I haven't, I haven't examined it in the last day, but at, at the point we're having a discussion, they had 14 wins in quadrant one and two, and I think that's at the top. So now they've had a number of opportunities, but uh, uh, they obviously had a good week last week, but uh, they're eight and three away from Cincinnati. Uh, in fact, the top four seeds, if you look at Virginia, Villanova, Xavier, and Purdue, are 40 and 8 combined away from home, which is an amazing statistic. But Xavier's shown that they can win on the road. They've shown that they, uh, they're they deep. They've shown that, uh, uh, that uh, they beat quality teams. So there was a lot of discussion about the four number one seeds, but not about moving them off the number one seed line. It was more about order. All right, so with Auburn, um, you know, I could see how someone could play devil's advocate here and say, okay, Auburn's, you know, at the top of the SEC, but their overall uh, non-conference strength, even though, as Bruce Pearl has told me, they went to Murray State, they went to Middle Tennessee State, which is great, going on the road, winning games like that, or playing on a neutral court, but they may not have as many high-profile, how higher rating wins. Why are they at the two line right now? Well, first of all, again, they have uh, 10 wins in the first two quadrants. They're 10 and two away from home. Uh, they're in a very difficult league. Uh, in a lot of ways, they've surprised people. They've had a very, very good schedule. They just weren't uh, good enough compared to the four above them. It's nothing from uh, taking nothing away from what Auburn has done. We just didn't feel they'd achieved to the same level that the four people above them had achieved. So Clemson, they have a big injury with Grantham, who's out for the season with an ACL tear, and yet they've played well after that. They beat North Carolina at home. How much was that discussed of how they've played since that major injury? Well, again, it's a great story, and Grantham was a tremendous player. But uh, I think they're they're either four and zero or four and one since the injury. And uh, they haven't played quite as well away from home, but they've done a nice job of regrouping. And, uh, uh, you know, we discussed the, the injury to Grantham, but we feel that uh, Clemson has demonstrated since that injury that they're deserving of where they are. So here's an interesting scenario with Oklahoma. Oklahoma, you know, played a great schedule. They've got good wins early. They're not playing well now. Um so this is what's interesting is how do you balance that the tournament, let's say hypothetically, since we're doing this now, were to start, let's say, tomorrow uh, and how they're playing right now versus their body of work? Well, first of all, uh, we have to look at the, again, it's not to be repetitive, but we have to look at everything. But Oklahoma has six wins that are first quadrant wins. Uh, that's that's better, more wins than anybody uh that's not in the tournament. And it's, in fact, it's more wins than a lot of people that are, are in the tournament in the first quadrant. So uh, the fact that they've lost a few more games than others, they still have demonstrated that, that they've had some very high quality wins. You know, the one school that's not on this before we finish up with the West that I could see there being some pushback, like to maybe replace in Oklahoma in terms of how they're playing now would be Rhode Island. Um, yes. What, what went into the discussion of Rhode Island's place in this top 16 right now and how they potentially could get into it? Rhode Island was a team that was very highly discussed by the committee, and they're right on that borderline. So they're a team that if they continue to win, uh, the committee feels very strongly about the caliber of Rhode Island. They just felt that, that uh, Oklahoma's number of quality wins uh, put them ahead of Rhode Island. But it was a long discussion. All right, let's go to and finish up with the West. Purdue, one. Kansas, two. Carolina, three. And Arizona, four. Um, once again, Purdue didn't have a great week, but they all came down to last possessions. I mean, it was, a, you know, Kata Bates, Diop, Tippin at home. Miles Bridges, three on the road. Uh, so their body of work, they don't have any bad losses. Is that, is that how, how the committee looked at it? Yeah, again, yes, and I think, again, sometimes people too, put too much uh, credence on the last week or the last couple uh, outings, But and Purdue uh, had two tough games, an overtime game against Ohio State, you were there, and then the Michigan State game. Those are tough place, 
tough games and tough teams. But when you look at their entire resume, uh, they were 11 and four in the first two quadrants. All five of their Q1 wins were away from home. So to show the ability to beat quality people on the road, they're very well balanced offensively and defensively. Uh, they, they were a strong candidate for a uh, uh, number one seed. So I have no issue with two, three, four, but if you can very quickly make the case for Kansas, Carolina, and Arizona. Okay, Kansas, again, Kansas had 13 wins in the top two quadrants. And Kansas has some losses that are, you know, a little bit puzzling. I think he's done a tremendous job with the roster that he has, but they are eight and two away from Lawrence uh, and 13 wins in quadrants one and two uh, overbalanced uh, the losses that they have. Um, North Carolina, North Carolina had a good week and you don't want to put too much emphasis on that, but North Carolina has shown the ability to beat quality teams and uh, Arizona uh, is an interesting discussion, and uh, Arizona uh, has some quality wins, uh, but uh, they're going to have to uh, uh, continue to win to have a chance to move up. And the last thing, Bruce, that I think that people still always have to remember is that you don't want to make a mistake, and because it's like we talked about, just because the team's not playing well right now, right. to then misseed them. And I think. You know, Duke could be a great example of that. Let's say Duke were to lose a couple more games. You don't want to put them at like a five or a six or some crazy thing like that because they still have the talent and have had the numbers to be up in that, you know, top four, uh, in the top four line. So I think that's, is that, you know, how much do you sort of have to really couch, okay, they're not playing well now, but this team has shown, has wins that really should put them higher up because we don't want to have suddenly have a one facing, you know, a right. team in an eight that potentially could be right there. Well, those and that's a great point, Andy. Those people that have coached understand that this the season is not a gradual move up. You don't just get a little bit better every game. You have peaks and valleys, and teams have them at different times. And if you're playing 30-some games, you're going to have a handful of games where you say, boy, I wish we played this way all the time. And you're going to have four or five where you're struggling. And so you don't want to put too much credence in that stretch where you were playing great. And you don't want to put too much credence in that stretch where you were struggling. You need to look at the overall and try to get a good assessment of the strength of the team. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what Duke does with the last 25% of their, their schedule. So you guys were 15 to 16 last year. Uh, what do you think the chances are that you guys will be close to that this season? Well, I think the chances of that happening are slim. <laughs> But it'll be interesting to see because, again, while we say teams have 25% of their schedule yet to play, they've got 75% in the bank. So a game, a result, or a couple results aren't going to impact that much. So it'll be interesting to see. Bruce Rasmussen, the chair of the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee, the athletic director at Creighton. Thanks for joining us here in our NCAA.com March Madness Skype session. Thank you, Andy.